Right, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 20, 33rd meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014. Ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices um, as they even interfere with the broadcasting when they are at silent. Apologies have received from Alison McInnes. I'll say to members that items 6 and 7 are not, have been withdrawn from the agenda as the um, order is being relayed. So we won't be dealing with those today. That's all good news. Makes our meeting a little more sharp and swift. Um, item 1, the uh, committee is invited to agree to consider item 9, a draft report and assisted suicide Scotland bill in private. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item 2, uh, this is a one-off evidence session on implementation of the Commission on Women Offenders recommendation. I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice to the meeting. I also welcome Colin McConnell, Chief Executive of the SPS and Scottish Government officials, Andy Bruce, Deputy Director, Community Justice Division, and Jane Muffet, Community Justice Division. I understand, Cabinet Secretary, you wish to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, Convener. I'm pleased to be able to join you this morning to uh, discuss implementation of recommendations uh, from the uh, Commission on uh, Women Offenders Report. Um, uh, achieving better life outcomes for women who get caught up in the criminal justice system and reducing the female prison population is an important aspect of the Government's social justice agenda. As the committee will be aware, this is the third progress report uh, since Dame Eilish Angelini report, reported in April 2012, and I'm pleased to say that significant progress has been made. The committee will uh, no doubt uh, wish to ask questions about the detail of that work. As, uh, much, uh, as much as we are very pleased with the progress that has been made, uh, there is still much to be done, particularly to divert women at er an early stage in their involvement with the criminal justice system and to really get to an integrated approach from all of the mainstream services that women need to help them change their lives for the better uh, and uh, a life which is, uh, involves not offending. Uh, last week I visited one of the uh, one-stop shop uh, women's centres that we have created, the Tomorrow's Women at Glasgow Centre. I spent time with the multidisciplinary team and some of the women who use the centre and I was very impressed by how collaboratively uh, the team are working and how much this is making a positive difference to the lives of some of the most vulnerable uh, people in our community. However, looking ahead, uh, we need to get better alignment uh, between community justice planning and provision and wider CC CPP activity, uh, which is why I announced uh, yesterday one of the key features uh, of the future model for community justice will be the local strategic planning and delivery of community justice services through our community planning partnerships. However, convener, I'm conscious that the committee uh, will wish to discuss the report in more detail and I'm more than happy to respond to any questions the committee may have. You've just won friends by making a brief opening statement. Questions, please. Margaret, John Finney. Uh, good Gil. morning, Minister. Morning. Uh, I don't know if you've had sight of the, the Howard League re report, but um, it's very critical of the, the direction that the government is taking in uh, replacing Contraveil with what seems to be a large pr prison, which is contrary to the uh, Angelili Commission report for a smaller specialised prison for women serving statutory defined long-term sentences and who present a significant risk. Would the Minister like to comment on that? Well, I am aware of the Howard League's view on this matter, and I actually met with them last week to explore this and to discuss it with them in more detail. There's obviously a significant amount of planning being undertaken by the SPS into the development of a new uh, uh, women and young offenders uh, institution in Inverclyde. And what I intend to do is to uh, just take the opportunity to understand all of the different aspects that feed into thinking about the future shape of that particular facility before any final decision is made on the matter. Uh, which will include looking at the size of it and the, uh, the model and approach which we're taking. I, I don't necessarily accept the Howard League's interpretation is that the, the, the proposal from the SPS uh, goes against the, uh, uh, the Commission's report. Um, it was a hub-and-spoke 
approach which was recommended by uh, the Commission and the uh, facility at Inverclyde will not only be a national facility, there will also be a regional facility there as well. Uh, but we also have the uh, new regional facility up at, um, uh, in Grampian, at the new prison there for uh, women offenders. Uh, and we'll also uh, at a very uh, a very final stage in taking forward the uh, the plans for a new women's facility at HMP Edinburgh as well. Uh, so um, I'm very much of the view that we are taking forward the approach that was outlined by the the, the commission around the hub and spoke approach. Um, uh, but the final configuration in terms of size, etc., is a matter I want to take a wee bit of time just to understand all the various dynamics that feed into that uh, before coming to any final decision on uh, what approach we should take uh, going forward. Yeah, yes, it certainly was a hub and pro, uh, spoke approach. Um, and the Angelini Commission reflected, I think, what the Equal Opportunities Committee had reported on in the report that was very well uh, welcomed and um, well received by the government. But I think it was all a question of, of size, really. The hub seems to be much bigger, almost bigger than the existing Contonville. And the spoke um, was supposed to be monitored more in the 218 centre and replicating that kind of facility throughout the country. So I think that's where the, the disparity um, lies. I don't think there's a, a difference of view around wanting to reduce our uh, female prisoner uh, population. I think at, at present our female prison population is too high. Uh, I want to see further measures that will assist us in reducing our female prison population. Um, in Scotland, if you consider, for example, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, there has almost been a doubling of our female prison population. But I also want to make sure that female offenders who are in prison are in a, an environment which is suitable for them, it's humane, it has the right type of support and conditions that help to assist them to address their offending behaviour and to uh, uh, prevent them from offending again in the future. So it has to take place within a modern estate and we know that Compton Vale isn't a suitable environment for that to take place at the present time. It's also worth keeping in mind is that I think around 75% of a uh, uh, female offenders who receive a custodial sentence are receiving sentences which are uh, for short a short period. Um, and uh, the primary focus of the hub and spoke is that, uh, is that those women offenders, for example, in the north of Scotland, uh, that with their serving a short sentence or are in remand, will go to HMP at Grampian. If it's in the east, they will be in uh, they'll be in HMP Edinburgh once that's established, or in the west, which is where the largest amount of them come from, will be uh, at the at the uh, Inverclyde uh, regional facility there as well, uh, and the national facilities, obviously, for those who are. What happens Pardon? in the south? Where two of us represent. Borders constituencies. So, what about the south? Well, Where they would they would probably be between either the west and also the uh, east uh, unit, which would be provided. So, um, so that hub and spoke approach, I think, is one which is reflective of the uh, uh, the the proposals that were outlined in Angelini uh, Commission report. Um, but the uh, final determination of the size of it will be based upon what I think around the projections going forward how much we believe we can achieve in terms of reducing a female prisoner population um, and what I think is in the best interests of meeting the ongoing needs of our, our female prison population. But there is no difference between the view of the Howard League and the Scottish Government about our desire to reduce the uh, female prison population and whatever the decision is over in Verclyde. Um, uh, uh, and if it is to go, for example, with the existing proposal, um, uh, that no way reflects uh, any lack of determination on our part uh, to see uh, a reduction in our female prison population in Scotland. What's important is the facility which is developed is one which is flexible enough in order to reflect that change um, as we start to see a reduction in our female prison population in the years to come. I welcome the, the fact that this is being looked at, especially um, to see if the geographical um, placing of prisoners, which is to be welcomed near a home, actually reflects the kind of service that could be expected in a 218 type centre. But you have said, um, Cabinet Secretary, it's important that um, women prisoners are in the right environment. So I wonder if you could perhaps update the Committee on Progress um, with dealing with women with mental health problems. Well, there is uh, one of the uh, areas of work which we've been taking forward, uh, which I've been involved in uh, from my previous ministerial responsibility, which was the 
uh, uh, the ministerial uh, 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 group on uh, reintegration of offenders into the community, which is a very complex issue because of the multi-agency nature of it, from health through to housing through to uh, 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 other support services, including mental health uh, services. And one of the aspects of work which was identified there was being able to uh, ensure that female prisoners are able to get access to the right um, uh, psychological support and the right mental health services that they may require. So one of the recommendations that's come from that group and through our National Prisoner uh, Health Network is to undertake a review um, of the way in which we deliver uh, psychological therapies within the prison estate, which is now part of the NHS and how that's delivered and how we can improve upon that. And we expect to receive a report from the National Prisoner uh, uh, Network, I believe, by the, su the summer, uh, uh, June of next year, uh, and how we can uh, make further improvements to how uh, mental health services are delivered within the prison estate. At present, then, if there's a, a very serious and violent um, offender, male offender, then they go to Carstairs. Is there anywhere similar in, in Scotland to, to deal with um, any prisoner that might have very severe and, and be violent? Well, obviously, there's risk assessments that are undertaken in terms of the uh, the nature of the need of a particular prisoner. I'll bring Colin in, who can maybe explain how the prison service manage particular women who may have complex mental health issues um, within our existing prison estate. But, for example, um, we just discussed uh, the uh, Inverclyde uh, uh, facility, and one of the proposals from the SPS around Inverclyde is to have a, a facility there that can better manage uh, uh, female prisoners who have complex mental health uh, conditions and may require more support and assistance than we can provide at the present time. But I'll maybe ask Colin uh, to maybe just outline a bit more in detail on how we manage these types of indig individuals within the SPS. Uh, thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, of course, I think you hit the nail on the head when uh, when you said you know particular or, or acute uh, needs uh, and. I mean, our, our close working relationship with the NHS, I think, is something that's developing as we uh, move along day to day. I think, for the most part, uh, men or women in custody uh, are, as far as is possible, certainly getting access to uh, quality of care and treatment uh, in the circumstances you've described. That, as I say, that are at least equivalent to that that you'd find in the community. But those that are sent to custody who present with extreme or extraordinary uh, conditions, I think, as, as you and I would, would probably agree, are, are quite unique. And whether um, facilities exist in every single circumstance to meet every single need, it's probably not in my bailiwick to comment on that. But what I can tell you is that we have relationships with... Um, uh, facilities in England and Wales uh, too, so we look at those on a sort of national uh, basis. Uh, we had one recent case, it was Tertia Kidd uh, at Condon Vale, who had uh, you know, experienced difficulties over a long, long time, and because Tertia was, was prepared to, to work with us, uh, where others aren't, of course, it wasn't a case of looking for somewhere um, like a male facility at, uh, at car stairs was actually to look more widely at where the appropriate facility would be for that particular individual. Uh, and as it was, uh, uh, Tertia, I think, went to Rampton, uh, I think, uh, and that was quite appropriate. So I think there's, there's a challenge there for us all to make sure that as far as possible we can address individual needs as they arise, but recognise that extreme needs are probably best uh, best addressed on a case-by-case uh, -case basis and looking more broadly at where the opportunities to address those needs are. Yeah. If I let other people in, if you've got yeah, very, very brief It was just a very brief one to ask um, about NHS Lothian. I think they had a pilot being carried out, which you were referring to last time, asked about mental health generally. Uh, you thought there may be some tests carried out there that would be good to look at for women in prison in its two-year programme halfway through. Any feedback from that? It's a programme. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's something that uh, was, was initially piloted in, in Conton Vale, uh, mentalisation-based uh, therapy uh, for those that have attachment uh, problems. And that's about interpreting 
your behaviour in relation to others, and perhaps touched on some of the some of the issues that affected Tertia in her day-to-day -day life. Uh, so there is, a, there is a pilot currently ongoing uh, in Edinburgh. It's a two-year uh, pilot. And there's some positive indications coming out at this stage uh, that there's perhaps application for um, the mentalisation based therapy, not just in custody, but also in the community. And I think in the discussions that we're having here in terms of integration, that's undoubtedly the way to go forward. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yes. Uh, from the community point of view, so we have the Willow Centre in Edinburgh and the multidisciplinary team in Edinburgh are linked into the staff in, in prison. So there's, the plan is to have that sort of transferred back out into the community too, so that the individuals are the, the workers that are supporting individuals understand the, the, the kind of the basics of communicating with people with borderline personality disorders, and they can continue the good work that started in the custodial environment. And an important part of trying to improve the way in which mental health services are delivered is the joined up linkage between community and uh, prison based services and in, in our last mentor or our existing mental health strategy there were some aspects within our national mental health strategy to recognise that with our prison population that's due um, that it completes its process by uh, next year 2015 the mental health strategy and we're already engaged in looking at how we can build in some of the prison aspects uh, uh, into that whole process much more effectively to improve that linkage. That's why we've commissioned some of this work in order to uh, uh, review the process by the summer of next year to feed into that process. I'm just going to move on. Could you give us um, to John Finney, um, Gil, Elaine and Christian? But before I do, can I just ask the number of women you say in very special circumstances for whom, as it were, the orthodox prison is not appropriate and you have to find other facilities to deal with them. Could you give an idea of the numbers involved in this? Well, well, certainly, convener, and, and certainly in my time in SPS, uh, only one, and that's, uh, that's been Tertia Kidd. And of course Tertia's um, history expands over a, a number of years, not, not, not just in custody, but of course in the community yeah. too. It's useful to know yeah. how, how, how often yeah. this has to occur and you have to get into these. Yeah. Uh, John Finney, please. Okay, thank you, Leo. Morning, panel. Uh, a question for you, Cabinet Secretary. It's to follow on, actually, from something my colleague Margaret Mitchell said, and it was about the recommendation which said quantum wheels should be replaced by a smaller specialist unit. Now, some of the reasons that sheriffs sent women there were they said there was a dearth of appropriate facilities in the community for these women. There was no alternative. And I'm just floating the idea, is there a possibility that unless things change in the community, that with all these super duper new facilities and super duper new uh, arrangements and the tie up with the NHS within the prison that it will make it more likely that a disposal will be one of a custodial nature for a woman. The first thing I would say is that I, I, don't, um, I don't accept the idea that if you build a facility that has so many places in it that you will just fill it. And a case and example is uh, Pullman. Uh, Pullman has undergone major refurbishment. It is a state-of-the-art facility, uh, which we now have for young offenders, uh, but the numbers there have actually been decreasing. And they've been decreasing because a range of different measures have been taken to uh, around alternatives to custody, etc., which have uh, uh, played an important part in contributing towards that. So um, I, don't buy, I don't accept that, there's just, that if, you, if you create facilities, then uh, sheriffs will just fill them. What I do accept, though, and I think the, the key to your uh, uh, question is that if you don't have um, a shival confidence uh, uh, in the alternatives that we have within the community, then you will then find that sheriffs will tend to then just make a custodial sentence. Not as simple as that, but if they don't have confidence in it and they don't have knowledge of it, a big part of the work that have been taken forward since we've had uh, the Commission's report is to make sure that we not only improve the quality of what's delivered uh, as alternatives uh, and support mechanisms within the community, but we have a greater range of them in a way that helps to reflect local needs uh, uh, as well. So I, I fully accept an important part to the approach we take around women offenders in order to reduce that prison population is to make sure we've got good quality, sustainable, accessible alternatives and support mechanisms within uh, the community. That goes without saying whatsoever. What we need to do, what is difficult though, is to, is to assess that by providing X in the community will result in X of a reduction in the prison population. That is an extremely difficult thing to do and probably something that I don't think anyone has actually cracked as yet. 
So it's very difficult to measure that. And very often it's you find out what the impact is through experience rather than being able to model it and what it will actually uh, do in itself. And that's part of the challenge around making a decision around Inverclyde, is that we are in a position where we are seeing um, improvements in the way in which alternatives and support is provided in the community. What impact will that have on the, prison, the female prison population in future years? At this stage, it's still difficult to tell, but I, uh, we anticipate that it will see, will see a reduction. Um, but until we actually see that reduction, it's difficult to plan on that basis. So given the lead-in time there is to building a prison, etc., and the facilities that go with that. So um, I fully accept that quality, the standard, and confidence in what's in the community is absolutely key to supporting us in working to reduce the female prison population in Scotland. And that's an issue that was identified by this committee uh, a number of years ago uh, about shivo confidence being key to making sure that we see that change in attitude. Are there any specific proposals in Cabinet Secretary commensurate with the, the welcome good facilities that will be for those who require to be in custody to give that confidence to, to the bench that there are viable alternatives in the community? Because none of us want to see anyone incarcerated who can be dealt with in the community. So, as we've outlined in the, um, in the uh, annual report, there's a range of things that have been taken forward. So, for example, the uh, 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 Tomorrow's Women Glasgow project that I visited uh, last week is a very good example of uh, a project which is helping to make a difference in uh, uh, reducing uh, uh, the risk of women reoffending um, and the way in which it's joining up services uh, in a collective way. So. Um, uh, integrating, you know, this is a team that we have in this particular centre, which is, um, it's not just um, uh, social work, it's there, housing are there, uh, the police are there, the prison service have got staff seconded there, um, uh, all working uh, in partnership to try and help to reduce reoffending amongst the women who are actually referred into the project. That's an approach which we've used. We have uh, uh, in Edinburgh as well, things at the Willow Centre, which provide that. And there's also the, um, uh, the centre in Aberdeen as well. That's a, one particular model. We also have the uh, other models which have been taken forward, for example, in Lanarkshire, uh, which is around um, uh, 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 the social work criminal justice team, having a specific women's team within that that's working with women offenders to test out that particular model. We have in some of our rural areas, uh, we have a, an outreach approach, which is about helping to support in these women in their communities much more effectively to test out that particular approach because what works in Glasgow is not going to work in the Highlands uh, necessarily, so we need to test out different models as well. So all of that work uh, that we're supporting just now is to help inform what is the most effective way to help to support women much more effectively in the community and to reduce reoffending. And there's evaluation uh, being wrapped around all of these particular initiatives to assist us in understanding that much more effectively. And uh, some of that evaluation work we'll have next year, which will list, allow us to then look at uh, what's the best way in going forward. And one of the things that I'm considering just now, having just come into the job, is how can we much more effectively draw that type of work together um, in order to share that good practice much more effectively uh, across the sector. Um, uh, and um, uh, I've just started to develop some of my early thinking around how we might be able to achieve that in the criminal justice side from some of my experience in the health side and how we went about it. So, so there's a range of work we're doing just now, different models and approaches which we're evaluating, which will all feed into our thinking around how we can better uh, make use of uh, reducing reoffending and helping to so support women much more effectively in the community. One final brief, whenever. Mr. Connell, you wanted to come in. Just, uh, just on the back of, I think, some of the really useful things the Cabinet Secretary just said. And I, su I suppose it is to slay this, this dragon, the, the suggestion that somehow um, prisons in the modern sense are distinct and disconnected from the community. I think the issue uh, for us is that the direction of travel is to increasingly integrate uh, the facilities of custody with the wider approach that the justice community and social justice community takes. So my uh, offer to, to the committee is the recognition that investing in the custodial estate, you've heard me say before, Scotland should not be embarrassed about having a world-class prison service because as part of the overall community, that's a fantastic facility and series of facilities, integrated facilities for the community to have, and I think touches on uh, some of the issues that Mr Finney has just uh, just raised. Thank you very much.
John. Please, and, and it is from the report, I presume, compiled by your predecessor, Cabinet Secretary. But it's about the problem-solving uh, uh, approach in court. The, 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 the phraseology there suggests a measure of uh, persuasion being required to get everyone on board. Uh, is that going to be resolved? Can we see that rolled out further? Well, we're now at the stage, um, before I bring in Andy Bruce, who's been involved in this process, um, uh, it's a new way of working, uh, which... Um, <coughs> can bring its own challenges uh, and uh, uh, I think combined with the uh, new approaches. Um, we have now um, uh, got agreement with the Sheriff Principal in Aberdeen uh, for the establishment of uh, a pro problem solving court and we're now in the process of working through some of the practicalities of that and how that can then be taken forward um, uh, uh, in Aberdeen. So I think it's something that we would have hoped to have made a bit further progress on than we've been able to but we've now got uh, a position where we, we can actually pilot it and test it out uh, in agreement with the Sheriff Principal in Aberdeen and um, um, I'm confident that will then allow us to then look at how that model can then be used in other areas. In the same way we've used with other specialist courts that have developed over recent years is that uh, once we've tried them out and tested out that process uh, we can then learn from that and look at how that can then be utilised in the rest of the criminal justice system. But Andy can maybe give you a bit more detail. Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. It's taken a, a bit of persuasion to do that and that was around the need to explain to local public partners what the problem solving approach was and to, and to build their, their support for it. We have done that as the Cabinet Secretary said Aberdeen Sheriff Court is going to be the, the, the target for that um, we have a supportive Sheriff Principal, an enthusiastic Sheriff who is up for that and also the partners in the community that will wrap around it so the work now is to identify exactly what the, the cohort is going to be that they're going to focus on but it's likely it will cover both women and, and men um, and of course with the focus, with the, the the female element of that, there's a chance to link in with the um, Women's Justice Centre that we funded in Aberdeen as well. Okay. What is Thank you very much. Solving approach. So it's effectively kind of freeing up the, the the judge to rather than be the kind of the, the arbiter and, and passive in the um, in the proceedings to actually get down off the bench and and you know almost try and join up the services around it. So I guess there's probably similarities to um, what happens around the children's hearing sort of methodology. It's that sort of freeing up the, the decision problem solving kind of approach of, of, the, of the sheriff, um, him or herself. And also one of the benefits is that there's a kind of continuity. So that sheriff will be involved in the, the person who's before them, their case, if it but comes like back again. Courts, so is it where the it's same very similar to the drug court. So, so Sheriff Wood sheriff, would describe yeah. what he does in, in Glasgow, the drug court as, as a problem solving approach okay. as well. The Centre for Justice Innovation um, are sort of experts in this field and they're yeah. working with us in developing this approach and taking it forward and how it will be shaped. That's fine, thank you. I now move to Gil, followed by Elaine. Um, Cabinet Secretary, in some work that I've been doing over a good number of years uh, with regards to violence against women and children, one of the things that was quite clear uh, to people involved in that area when it came to women engaged in prisons or prisoners that one of the uh, one of the biggest problems is thinking about the family uh, uh, back at, at home uh, about their children and particularly when uh, perhaps a husband or partner has either flown the nest or the worry is that that might happen and one of the things the commission has suggested was using a uh, video conferencing and yet, uh, when it came, comes to Quentin Vale, the chief executive of the Scottish Prisoners uh, Services stated during the Justice Committee's meeting in August 2014 that this type of personal access was not available. And he went on to say, we are not currently planning to pr provide such access on the basis that would have to be well consulted in order to check out the sens sensitivities and risks that may be perceived. And, you know, one, I, I, you know, I do believe that if we could uh, get this right in terms of keeping uh, families in touch uh, or, or women in prison in touch with their families uh, in a kind of more meaningful way, uh, that it might really help that uh, process and, and maybe stop uh, people going into depression and taking drugs and all the other things that are associated with uh, with these matters, and I wondered what the government felt about that. 
Well, I can say now at Compton Vale we have the video conferencing facilities available which is there for uh, use around um, access, um, so for uh, contact with families, um, also for uh, uh, some aspects of uh, court and also with legal agents um, as well. We've also uh, got the facility now in uh, HMP Grampian. Uh, which is for both male and females uh, for a similar purpose. What we're doing, and uh, Colin can maybe explain a bit further in terms of the SPS approach, and this is testing out um, the effectiveness, the impact it can have as well, um, uh, and uh, uh, before we look at rolling that out further um, uh, within the prison estate in Scotland. So we have made progress in that the facilities now available in Compton Vale and that we have it now in HMP uh, Grampian. I do recognise that there are, particularly um, when you have a national facility like Compton Vale, um, the uh, children being able to uh, contact their uh, mother is an important aspect of it. There's issues around how that's managed and how you support the child as well, of course, um, uh, and what can be quite difficult for uh, particularly young children, um, uh, which is just the sort of thing that we have to understand more fully in looking at how we can uh, uh, make most or better as much use as we can of video conferencing, but doing so in a way that's appropriate uh, uh, with the right safeguards in place. But Colin can explain a bit further. Yeah, thanks, Cabinet it. Secretary. Uh, yeah, I think it's just important to reframe uh, your, your comments that in terms of the general conversation we were having, every prison in Scotland currently has video facilities that can link with the courts. Uh, some are increasingly linking with agents uh, and, uh, in some cases, uh, some uh, social work uh, locations. But primarily, the, uh, the video conferencing facilities are, are there to service the courts. So I think that's, that's the first uh, point to make. I think beyond that, Again, if you look at our organisational review, if you uh, ever have the time or the inclination to, to read some of the speeches I've, I've been making, I don't think conceptually or ideologically there's any, there's a cigarette paper between us uh, in the sense that this, what you're describing is an extraordinarily positive direction to be going in. But I recognise that much of the technology that's already there that we could use, particularly the social, me social media uh, related uh, technology, has with it some risks. And I, I, as I say, whilst the direction of travel undoubtedly is to explore how better we connect particularly women with their children, but more broadly how we connect those in custody with their families on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is the direction of travel, but we have to do so cautiously. The, Cabinet Secretary quite rightly in answering uh, one of Mr Finney's uh, questions said that the Shrevel benches had to have confidence in the offer that's in the community. Well sim similarly I think the prison service has to ensure that parliamentarians, the government, uh, the public can have confidence as we bring forward uh, new approaches. So I think putting it in context the direction of travel is undoubtedly as you describe it but we're doing so cautiously in order to properly explore and build up that confidence as we move forward. It's in the right direction. Well, that's good. I, I, I'm pleased to hear that. In a similar vein, and again, it's about, about um, women in prison and what causes them uh, anxiety. Uh, you know, and another big one is the fact that the possibility of losing their house while they're in prison and you know, losing residency is an enormous problem, and I wondered what view and what uh, what the government was doing, recognising that, that uh, housing is a, a local uh, government uh, matter. But nevertheless, I wondered if, if there's any work being done to try and ensure that this practice, uh, you know, or minimise it uh, as, as much as we can. There's a there's a, a couple of aspects here. There's one about um, um, uh, women who receive a custodial sentence and then um, uh, then lose their property as a result of uh, not being there. Uh, and uh, part of the challenge is about making sure that we are making much more effective use of community-based disposals, uh, which reduces the risk of women in the first place losing their property in the way that John Finney highlighted about the importance that that we have good uh, quality. Um, uh, community alternative programmes in place and also to reduce reoffending. So 
uh, they're important aspects that can help to reduce the uh, difficulties that uh, result uh, uh, from a, a, a woman losing uh, her property. But the other aspect is that, um, uh, that I'm very clear about is that uh, you know a person's home can often be their anchor within the local community. Uh, and when we uh, liberate uh, someone from prison, it's extremely important that we are in a position where they're able to actually go to uh, a home, uh, their own home or someone else's home, um, uh, in order to re-establish themselves and reintegrate back into the community. And the ministerial group on uh, uh, reoffending is, uh, uh, we've established a pilot uh, in Perth, uh, at HMP Perth, in order to look at how we can much more effectively make sure that individuals who, uh, when they are liberated from uh, prison, that we have got housing provisions and needs uh, sorted before they actually go back into the community. Uh, because the danger is that if you don't have these things sorted out, when people are being liberated back into the community, they can very quickly just get drawn back into offending behaviour. So we are doing a piece of work there in order to do that. We've also commissioned some research right across the country uh, to understand more fully about housing providers, their engagement, the work that they're doing, and how we can better align uh, the work of the SPS uh, and also uh, housing providers as well for the reintegration of offenders in order to help to support the work we're doing to reduce reoffending uh, rates. And uh, when I was at the uh, the uh, 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 Tomorrow's Women Centre in Glasgow just last week, there was uh, one of the, uh, the uh, full-time members of staff there is from the uh, uh, from Glasgow Housing Association, and that's their job is to help to work with housing agencies in order to so support these women uh, to get housing issues um, addressed. So it's about being much more integrated um, uh, and helping to support those who go back into the community, but also at the same time helping to make sure we've got the right alternatives in the community to reduce both reoffending and the need for women uh, getting into prison for particularly short term. Uh, periods which can end up leading to a loss of their property and all of the other complications that flow from that, uh, which is why it's important we continue to take forward this work around supporting women in the community more effectively. Thanks very much. Maybe I can come in later on. You will be aware that the 218 project, in fact, one of the first things that they did was to ensure that the women there kept their tendency, which would automatically be lost. And, I mean, it seems to me terribly important when looking at the stats, 77% serve sentences of six <laughs> months or less, unless there's a good reason that it may be the wrong place for the woman to return to for reasons that may be part of the problem that's why she's there, that it seems that they're already, this is already happening, um, certainly with Project 218. They're already doing this so that the women didn't lose their tendency with Glasgow Housing Association. So that's exactly the type of yeah. thing that we need to build upon. And, yeah. uh, for example, the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Tomorrow's Women Centre in Glasgow, for example, uh, the housing official there was explaining is that uh, sometimes there is good reason for a woman not to return of to course. a particular property or to a particular area. Um, and uh, that's something that's not always appreciated by housing officials uh, when they just receive a referral for um, a particular property for someone who's uh, coming out of prison or uh, within a particular programme. So uh, that's the type of thing that the centres and joining up the services much more effectively can help to address uh, uh, in a better way, and that's what we need to continue to develop moving forward. I think the committee would support that. Can I move on to Elaine, Christian, then Roderick, then Margaret, please? Thank you, uh, I wanted to look a little bit at um, rehabilitation and, and, and through care and, and the process of, of women being able to be rehabilitated back into the community. I wondered if what sort of progress was being on, made, made on that, and in particular, as somebody from the South, um, where women are not, the place of their incarceration is f not maybe near all that near their home. If there are issues in terms of support and through care, where somebody's going to a community which is quite distant from where, distant whether they, you know, what, are there lessons that are being learned around that? Is how you ensure that that sort of through care is, is as effective for women who are living further, whose communities are further away from their place of imprisonment. So I think one of the um, aspects around this is about uh, making sure we do more to support these particular individuals. Um, uh, and one of the ways in which we've been uh, taking forward the area of work in this area is around the mentoring programme. So particularly identifying those women um, uh, who are serving short-term sentences or are on remand 
uh, and helping to uh, uh, work with them uh, much more effectively to try and achieve better outcomes for them. So there's a a, a, a range of work that will be taken forward around mentoring and maybe Jane will be able to explain a bit more in terms of the detail of that and its impact on the ground. Um, but what we are learning from that is that um, at the mentoring programmes that we have already been supporting, which I think is supporting something in the region of around 700 um, at women on an annual basis, it can be a very useful way in terms of helping to improve um, uh, 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 through care uh, within the prison system and then back out into the community and helping to uh, reduce uh, reoffending behaviour, helping to support the links uh, to agencies as well is one of the important uh, ways in which we can help to support women, in particular those who may come from uh, more remote areas. But Jane can maybe explain a bit more on how the mentoring programme is operating on the ground. Just to add to what the Cabinet Secretary has said, so particularly for women who are in the, the south of, of Scotland, they will either be held in, in Edinburgh or on the west. And so there are uh, mentors who are based in those prisons and they will start the early work with the woman to understand what's going on in her life and what the issues are and make connections with the agencies to try and do as much of that prevent uh, sort of preparatory work as possible before liberation. They will then link in with the local mentors who are in, in the locality, so in Dumfrieshire or whatever. And that a relationship will, be, will then be built between the mentor that's in prison, the woman and the, the, the mentor who's going to be taking kind of over responsibility for supporting the woman when she comes back out. The outreach approach that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned earlier is one of the kind of four themes of the, the, the way that we're trying to support services across Scotland post Angelini means that the, the, kind of the teams that are in the area will then know that this woman's coming back into Dumfrieshire, for example, know that there's a mentor involved and the mentor will be able to help the woman kind of navigate the various services and, and, and agencies that she needs to in order to get her life back together again. Yeah, and those mentors, the local yeah. mentors from yes. our community will go up to the prison and work because I think that community continuity of Absolutely. having an individual there whom you can yes. trust, particularly with the sort of anxieties of release exactly. and so on. It's the relationship is key. That's what mm. we've learned even at this early stage. And the Cabinet Secretary said that we're evaluating the mentoring service and all of the services that we've supported post Angelini. But what we do know at this early stage is that the quality of the relationship between the woman and her mentor is absolutely crucial in terms of her likelihood of succeeding to reintegrate. Her want and desire to reintegrate as herself as well is also crucial in this. But what, we, what we're finding is that a mentor can help keep her in a good positive place mentally and help her navigate the difficulties that she might come across because inevitably there may well be delays around getting a house or you know getting um, access to our children or so on and the mentor seems to be someone who is positive who can show her a different way of living our life and give her hope for the future and that seems to be working really well yes that's, that's interesting the other thing obviously for some of these women and it's related to what Gail Patterson was saying uh, was you know the access from families I mean if you're somebody from my constituency is not that easy to get. You know, public transport links are not that good either with Inverclyde or with Edinburgh. Uh, and there's, you know, we know that women offenders tend to get fewer visit, prison visits from families anyway. You know, as a, I know that there's um, some accommodation uh, which will enable children to be able to stay overnight in, in Inverclyde. I mean, it's a other. There seems to be less of that than there was at Court and Vale. Is that just because it, you know there's seven places at Court and Vale and four in the new prison? Is that? Yeah. I, th I think we have to be careful with mm. with the sort of how, how how many places. I think we we get confused in in the sense that, particularly with the, the history of Court and Vale, um, I think things have come and gone and been labelled in in all sorts of different ways. I think the point I would make about Inverclyde, and you would expect me to say this, wouldn't you? Um, I mean, this this is going to be a, a, an international exemplar of excellent practice. And in terms of the, 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 the future uh, approach to relationship with, with those who pass from the community into custody, that's, that's almost growing and developing uh, as each day goes, goes by. So it will be continually updated and for sure uh, there will be excellent facilities uh, at Inverclyde, regardless of its scope or scale, uh, at Inverclyde for, for women to spend good quality time with, with their children and wider family, for sure. In some of the Swedish prisons, they, uh, in low secure, for low-security prisoners, they actually can have visits in, actually in the cell rather than having to go to a visit, uh, visiting room. Has there been any thought around that for some female prisoners that actually having your children coming into your room to meet with you might be better for you, you know, 
your relationship with your children and having them coming into a formal waiting room? Again, I think in, in the scope and scale, for some, that, that might be absolutely appropriate. Of course, we've got to think on the other side, for the children, the other family members, the, 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 the consequence of, of moving into that environment. But in the round, and again, the direction of travel, is to bring families together for all the positive reasons that we know, but recognising that for some it will be more appropriate than others, but we want to maximise every single opportunity as it comes along. Thank you. Can I just add to the issue that uh, Elaine Murray raised as well in her first question around uh, uh, through care as well, one of the things that came from the uh, Ministerial uh, Working Group in Reintegration of Offenders was the uh, what at times can be a bit disjointed approach from different assessments for different purposes, housing, health, etc. And one of the things that's come from the uh, ministerial uh, group, uh, which I was a member of but now chair uh, in my new role, uh, is the uh, single multi-agency assessment for every prisoner, um, uh, whether it's short or long term, in order to make sure that we have that um, that comprehensive uh, assessment of their needs from housing through to health, etc., so that their through care is much better managed uh, and everyone has a part to play in helping to achieve that much more effectively. So that joined up working, which the SPS are now taking forward, is, as I say, is, is starting to bed in, which I think will help to improve the outcomes for female offenders and particularly for those who also have to go back to more remote areas. One of the other recommendations from the Ministerial Group on Offender Reintegration was this whole um, issue of Friday liberations, which I know the committee has, has raised before in previous kind of studies of through care and so on. And as a result of the Ministerial Group's consideration of the matter, there are provisions in the Prisoner Control of Release Bill which will uh, allow a, a certain element of flexibility to prison governors to release up to two days early to avoid the Friday liberation scenario, particularly for people going back to remote and rural areas, where it's, it, it's going to be in their interest to be released early because there's a plan in place to help them reintegrate more effectively back into the community. Can I just um, ask, and I'm sure this is the case, that any children visiting a parent incarcerated, in this case a mother, it would have to be in the best interest of that child. That would always be the test, notwithstanding the benefits to any prisoner, but it must always be the test that the welfare of the child is paramount. Absolutely. And that that is the rule in doing that. Yep. Just to make it plain, yes, thank you. Um, because it might not be in the mm. child's interest Indeed. in some circumstances. Uh, Christian Roderick Margaret. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I just had a briefing last week from um, the third sector, from Adjust in Aberdeen, who are doing exactly the kind of work you were talking about, which is uh, trying to work in partnership and coordinating uh, all the services. But uh, they highlighted a, a lot of things. One of the things particularly we were talking about uh, the video conferencing. It seems to me that in Aberdeen, uh, video conferencing is only available for families uh, for uh, the male prisoners, but not for the female prisoners yet. And the same thing on the court, I, I'm seeking some reassurance. Uh, we're talking having a piloting in Aberdeen, but it's for uh, male and female. I, I, I just want reassurances that, you know, we're not going to have a, a two-tier system, but male will be first. Uh, male prisoners will we, we, we'll have facilities first, and then female prisoners, like, like video conferences, will be behind. I, I visited uh, SMP, uh, Glampian, and, and it's a bit unfair that you know, one gender gets some facilities that the other gender doesn't. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, I mean, the genesis uh, of the the video link, which I think I think you're referring to, at the Apex uh, Centre in Aberdeen. I mean, the concept is fantastic, and we we look to to build on on the lessons learned. But it is important just to remind ourselves of the genesis of it. You know, from in, in a sense, from a situation came out of that a great a great idea that we're going to build on. So that was originally put in place for those people sent to custody who would otherwise have gone to Aberdeen or Peterhead but had been displaced because of the interregnum between those prisons closing and, and Grampian opening. So essentially it was for families uh, in that area whose uh, relatives, partners were in Perth, Berlini, uh, all points south, really. And that worked, that worked well, but that was the genesis of it. The fact is it's been kept going uh, because it's, it's beginning to, I think, give us some indications of how we might do this in the future. 
But I, I think it's important to, to, to again, it's, it's these sort of dragons that, that, that crawl around. Uh, I think we can slay the dragon. This is not a facility that is per se for men in custody. Um, women have used it, but I want to make particularly the example of Cotton Vale, and it actually touches a bit on uh, what Elaine Murray uh, has, has said, because it's an uncomfortable truth. Women in custody tend not to get uh, many visits. That's just a harsh fact of reality, and we're trying to change that. But the facility at Grampian, because women from the North East and North more generally are now being held at Grampian, the requirement or the, the pressure perhaps otherwise that might have been put in uh, place at Cotton Vale to connect through the Apex hub that Aberdeen has significantly uh, been diminished. And I think over time uh, that that's been available. I think only two uh, two women have actually used it as a, a, a virtual visit uh, in that sense. So it does exist, but the demand for it uh, from uh, women in custody has not been as great as that of men. And again, that's just a fact. In terms of the, the direction of travel, we've talked about it already. We want to uh, flex those facilities as much as we can, but do so in a way that's robust and sustainable and provides assurances for everyone that's engaged in the process. Well, one of the problems will be um, the gender-specific training for staff, which is maybe not optimum yet. Well, we've, we've, um, I think when um, uh, my predecessor was here at committee the last time, we were um, uh, exploring the possibility of providing additional training for uh, SPS staff uh, who work with uh, female uh, offenders. Uh, that's now been embedded in the induction programme, so all SPS staff that will be working with female offenders have a, a two-day programme which is specific around uh, female offenders. So it's now um, what was initially been tested out, um, I think was initially a one-day uh, training programme. I'm entirely sure if that was the case with one day, and it's now a two-day programme, but that's now part of the induction programme that the SPS uh, have further uh, staff. There's also been um, uh, uh, additional training, uh, one-day training programme for SPS staff in general provided around female offenders. Um, uh, so uh, what was an initial test is now actually been embedded in the standard induction programme for all uh, individuals who come into the SPS uh, 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 staff group uh, and are going to be working with female offenders. If I may, another question. Uh, following Gil Patterson talking about housing and the problem of accommodation, I'm, and I'm reassured of what the Cabinet Secretary said about uh, uh, the possibility of having, of keeping a uh, tenancy for, for a short when, when uh, we're in prison for a short period of time. But what about a woman who are looking for uh, social uh, security benefits? Have you spoken uh, with the UK government to see if we could have maybe instead of having them stop, maybe be interrupted and making sure that uh, upon release the, the prisoners will know in advance that we uh, uh, we don't need to reapply, but if you automatically uh, start again uh, upon release. So this was an issue which we uh, considered again in the ministerial um, uh, group around uh, access to welfare uh, benefit provision. Um, and uh, there have been concerns raised around uh, the stopping of uh, uh, benefit provision. Part of the challenge is that... Um, uh, in, in my view, is about uh, uh, reducing the number of women who are actually receiving... Uh, uh, short-term custodial sentences, which raises a question, is, the, is prison the right place in the first place anyway? Um, uh, so that's the approach that we're trying to take to deal with that issue. There has been issues about going back out into the community, reintegrating back into the community to make sure that these issues are addressed much more effectively. We've pursued some of this issue around the uh, DWP, but of course that's a reserved area. But where we have got some powers, for example, around the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, which uh, provides issues around, can be used for things like furniture, etc., crisis, um, uh, 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 crisis loans and community care grants, is that uh, there were some issues around how that was operating and how it could be made uh, more effective and quicker in being able to respond to the needs of those who are being reintegrated back into the community. And as a result of the work from the Ministerial uh, Working Group, uh, new guidance uh, was issued around that uh, in order to help to shape the approach that's taken in the uh, prison around applications, how they'll be managed and how they'll be dealt with, and how local authorities will then actually deal with that as well. So uh, that's helped to speed up that process and made it clearer around the application process as well 
uh, as and when it can be uh, made in order to release that money uh, as early as possible to help to support uh, individuals being uh, reintegrated back into community. So we've been able to make some changes where we've got powers in order to improve the situation, uh, but some of the wider aspects are obviously with our, our control. Uh, the changes are very welcome, and they are already the assessment is made before release. I just want to reach in there. Yes, they are. And have you re written to uh, the DWP to try to get uh, them part of the same uh, assessment? Uh, Jane can maybe comment a bit further on this. Uh, 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 some of the aspects are that um, uh, we're limited in what we can do there because uh, it's a pan UK based approach to it, but there are, you know, my view is that. Um, you know, in terms of when we go back to women who are receiving particularly short sentences, losing their house, losing their benefits, all of the other challenges that come with that, they may have a child, the welfare aspects all come from that. I think the issue for us is to be helping to reduce that from happening and to prevent that from happening for individuals who shouldn't really be in prison and that prison is not the most appropriate environment for them is probably the most effective way to tackle some of these uh, issues. But Jane can maybe mention some of the wider work we're doing around welfare provision. Yeah. So um, th some of the other committee members will remember that um, Cabinet Secretary's predecessor wrote to Lord Freud immediately after the Angelini Commission reported and they had a, a meeting and on the back of that meeting we have a small scale pilot which is operating in Cornton Vale at the minute where women do get access to benefits advice much earlier before liberation than is normally the case uh, with the, the aspiration that they will get access to their money much quick, more quickly than they currently do. It is very small scale as the Cabinet Secretary says it is reserve policy so we are you know we, we, it's at the discretion of the, the UK government and, and, and I don't think there are plans to expand on that pilot but they are allowing us to continue with it in Cottonville at the minute. But what's important is how we support women when they come back out into the community. So the, 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 just, the justice centres that the Cabinet Secretary has already talked about, for example, in Glasgow, they have a benefit advisor come in and support the women to make sure that they're maximising their... their in, their entitlements to benefit and they're, they're claiming for everything they can. And the Scottish Welfare Fund, as the Cabinet Secretary says, makes sure that they've got some kind of transitional money to help them get through those kind of early days when, when things are really tight and to help them access the kinds of support they'll need to furnish their house and so on to, to make sure that they've got something to come back out to. Do the same problems arise in England where we don't have yes. it? It's exactly yes, the same, exactly so it makes no difference. They've it's, the same it, issue. This is not yeah. a Scottish issue, this is a UK it's issue. Just to do with the DWP yes, really, generally. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Roddy, please. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, morning. I'd just like to focus, uh, if I can, just on the, the three million pounds of funding allocated to support the local uh, criminal justice partners at present time over the 16 projects. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand in terms of the uh, more rural projects, the outreach projects, how that works. And do um, kind of women in those situations get the full ambit of, uh, of support that they would do in, in the other projects? Yes, they do. So, for example, in the Fife area, the team in Fife decided that they did not want a fixed base. They didn't think that that would be the best way to support women in Fife. So they, they work out of three locations. And so one day a week in each one of those locations, there's a kind of full day's kind of availability for women to drop into and to have appointments for. But that's followed up in the inter interim period with one-to-one -one sessions with a, an individual and their key worker. And any work that's kind of, you know, that needs to be progressed will be progressed. And this, what, the, the, the way that we've gone about um, the provision across Scotland is to work with the local partners. They all, have, they all use the Angelina report as a reference document. It's seen as a really valid, um, critical piece of, of, of writing, and it informs how they shape their service provision. But they've decided that you know they have to, that they want to kind of tailor it to how, how they can best meet the needs of the women in these kind of more rural localities. The, the women themselves don't want to have to make the travel to come into a centre when it can be miles and miles away. And of course, also the local service provision is miles back where the, the women themselves live. So the idea of the, the kind of outreach is that the, the team goes into those localities and works with the women to link them into the services, wherever they might be. Thank you for that. And there's a, an independent evaluation going to be yes, uh, carried out. Yes, there is. Um, in, to what extent is the, the results of that evaluation going to be a factor in consideration of kind of uh, community uh, planning partnerships going forward and delivery of community justice? Yeah, it's going to have an important part to play in helping to understand what's the most effective approach uh, for delivering services. And a big part of um, uh, uh, making sure that uh, CPPs uh, uh, 
uh, are able to do their job effectively around uh, the delivery of community justice programmes is to make sure that it's an evidence-based approach that they're utilising um, and that it, it is based upon experience uh, that helps to inform them about what's the best approach to apply at a local level. So um, uh, that's, that's what's important here is to make sure we're using an evidence-based approach. That's why all of the models are being evaluated independently to identify what the pros and cons are uh, and to uh, then to utilise that to help to support ongoing work. One of the things that I'm keen to explore, as I mentioned in my in an earlier response, is that uh, I want to give a bit more thought as to how we can help to um, uh, it, make sure we share that practice uh, and experience in a much more effective way. There's practitioner forums, etc. we have at the present time, but I think there's a there's a wider issue here and I want to just explore how we can achieve that more effectively so we are sharing and spreading good practice, improvement methodologies in a way that can assist us in, in delivering the most effective approaches within local areas and that CPPs have got the right type of advice and support and information to make that type of informed decision. Thank you. And in terms of evaluating the success of mentoring projects, is there anything else that you can add to that equation at the present time? Yeah. James probably better yeah. explain about the, the, the valuation of the sure. mentoring. So again, we, we're having that independently evaluated by Ipsos Mori, um, and uh, we have extended the evaluation in line with the, the fact that we've extended the, the change fund for another two years, because what we saw two years in was that we had kind of early signs of effectiveness, but it was clear that we wanted to give the, the mentoring service a, a longer period in which to demonstrate the, the impact that they were having positively. The idea behind all of these evaluations is of course I think one of the committee members mentioned that, that the ongoing provision of these services really kind of sits with with local government so the idea is that the evaluations will help local government and, and partners in the communities um, identify where they want to spend their resources on an ongoing basis as Angelini herself said that you know this could all be achieved within existing resources what we've tried to do is provide some additional money in the in the, 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 the two years to allow people to reconfigure their services as she described, so to give them a bit of breathing space to do that, but ultimately the sustainability will come from within localities, which is why we've allowed the kind of service provision to grow organically and to be driven by local partners' needs and desires, because that's what we see as being the most sustainable way to take it forward on the long term. Thank you. Mr McConnell, you wanted to, or were you indicating to me you wanted to? Just in the context of uh, mentoring services or outreach services and, and evaluation, and you'll know that we are changing the role of prison officers to dovetail with the work that's uh, going on in, in the community to bring that integrated approach. And the uh, the pilot uh, was run, again, as, as you've had a previous briefing on it at Greenock, uh, and that was value, evaluated uh, during the middle part of this year um, by colleagues working out of Edinburgh University, and the evaluation has been really encouraging. Um, with some real pointers of how positive practical support reaching out back into the community as people resettle can be. And actually one of the real uh, learning uh, opportunities from this is that women are the most likely to engage in ongoing mentoring services. So there's, there's, there's a real convergence here in terms of approaches, integration and targeting the people who are most likely to benefit from it. Thank you. Margaret? last one, Thank I think. You. Does the Cabinet Secretary support the introduction of child impact assessments to effectively help deal with the, the often very devastating effect imprisonment of a parent can have on children? What way would you see them operating? Impact assessments would look at the overall effect on children of a parent being, uh, uh, being imprisoned and it would look at um, all the various effects that that can happen. But I was meaning, do you mean that has been something so be that's submitted to the court? Something that's submitted yeah. to the court in determining the type of sentence that should be imposed? It, it is that, is yeah. that the way you're yeah. thinking about formal it? formal impact assessment. Taken so I think it's important that we make sure that, um, uh, that uh, when sheriffs are making determinations, they have as wide a range of information as possible to consider these issues. Uh, clearly there are different factors that they have to weigh up in terms of public safety. Um, appropriate sentencing, uh, but uh, welfare and child impact aspects should all be issues that are fed into that particular uh, process. And to 
uh, and to uh, to make sure that they're aware of any wider issues that may come from that. I think what is important is that is that where issues are identified uh, and a custodial sentence is still considered as being the uh, most appropriate route is that there's the right support services there uh, in order to support that particular child and to make sure their needs are being appropriately met uh, and uh, supported. So, uh, uh, Yes, I think they've got a, a role to play in helping to inform and understand matters, um, uh, 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 along with all of the other factors that clearly sheriffs and judges need to take into account when they're determining a sentence for someone. Okay. Just, a, just a little postscript here, just I think. Just finally, you made mention of £3 million of worth of funding uh, allocated uh, to support local criminal justice partners across Scotland. Would it be possible to be, provide the committee with a breakdown, maybe in writing, but actually how that's been allocated to different areas? That around the 16 projects have benefited from it. That would be very useful. Thank you very much. That ends this evidence session. I'll suspend for two minutes to allow witnesses to change over. Thanks. Item 3, Modern Slavery Bill, UK Parliament Legislation. Um, that's uh, The Cabinet Secretary has stayed with us for this item. I welcome to meeting the Scottish Government officials, Neil Rennick, uh, Acting Director Justice and Oxley Criminal Law and Licensing Division, Keith Main, Safer Communities Division, and Kevin Gibson, Director, Directorate of Legal Services, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief, emphasise brief, opening statement. <laughs> We're uh, very pressed for time today, Cabinet Secretary, but it's a very important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. The trafficking uh, of human beings and the use of them as commodities for profit is a heinous crime and one which the Scottish Government is committed to combating. Uh, this is a hidden crime that does not respect border controls or national boundaries and it's crucial that we uh, work with the UK and the Northern Irish Government uh, to make sure that our laws take this into account. Uh, the committee will be aware that a Scottish Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill has recently been introduced to Parliament. That bill will see the creation of a Scottish anti-human trafficking strategy enhancing support and protection for victims and includes measures to tackle human trafficking uh, related crime uh, through the Scottish criminal justice system. Uh, a UK wide commissioner uh, that can operate across the board, uh, share good practice and consistency of approach in tackling this crime and supporting its victims and holding each juris jurisdiction to account on the same basis uh, will complement this legislation. Uh, Scottish ministers will agree the work plan of the Commissioner, uh, request Scottish specific reports and lay uh, these before uh, Parliament uh, uh, that any such report may come from uh, the Commissioner. Powers are included for the redaction of any report which might jeopardise the safety of any person in Scotland or might prejudice the investigation or prosecution of an offence under the law of Scotland. Thank you very much. Yes, Christian. Uh, I just wanted to uh, have a little update of what the changes are uh, for uh, ships and vessels being investigated. What, what can Police Scotland can do today and what the changes will be? Well, as it stands at the present moment, uh, uh, 
Police Scotland have uh, general powers uh, in order to uh, investigate uh, uh, and detain and arrest in Scotland, and that uh, extends to adjacent waters, uh, which uh, are some 12 miles from uh, the coastline. Um, uh, what Scottish police officers don't have is the powers to go beyond uh, that particular 12-mile uh, 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 jurisdiction, uh, and that includes uh, uh, waters which are within the UK, uh, but out with uh, Police Scotland's uh, jurisdiction. And um, what the uh, uh, new provisions will give the power to do is for Police Scotland to be able to continue to pursue uh, that type of thing. So, for example, it could be uh, with the Irish Sea uh, going over into Northern Irish if they're pursuing a particular vessel, um, or uh, as was the case, um, uh, I think it was last year, in 2012, uh, there was a case where they were pursuing a, a vessel in, uh, off the coast in uh, Dumfries and Galloway and one uh, off the coast in Aberdeen. Um, and the challenge with the one in the coast of Aberdeen is that um, it went out with the 12 mile boundary, uh, which meant that they weren't in jurisdiction to be able to uh, uh, detain and apprehend them. Uh, uh, in that particular case, I think they had to wait for that vessel to run low on fuel and to come back into jurisdiction. Uh, but with these additional powers, it will give them the scope to be able to actually extend beyond that um, uh, as well. So it will give them that additional uh, range to be able to extend, to be able to detain individuals and to search and investigate vessels beyond the 12 mile limit at the present time. And also to pursue into uh, uh, UK waters uh, that are out with Police Scotland's uh, uh, jurisdiction and equally for uh, Police in England and Wales to be able to pursue into Scottish waters a vessel that they may be pursuing um, uh, as well without a, a need for a change. I'm just seeking some re reassurance uh, to make sure that uh, Scottish vessels are not going to be boarded more than foreign vessels, you know, that uh, in, 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 in waters that are, that are vessels from different countries. And we want to make sure that, you know, the support were appropriate. Sure. So if the vessels within uh, Scottish jurisdiction, uh, then obviously the, the Police Scotland are able to uh, to stop and to investigate and to, uh, and to search a vessel as necessary. Um, uh, I'm imagine that there would be any particular focus on Scottish vessels more than others, um, but it's to make sure that Police Scotland have got the necessary powers to be able to pursue these types of issues, given that they do cross boundaries uh, very readily, and it's a way in which they can evade uh, investigation, and by, uh, by providing these additional measures that allows Police Scotland to have the same uh, legal authority and powers as their counterparts in England and Wales in being able to pursue these matters. Okay, thank you for this. Uh, what about uh, a commissioner? Uh, what is the scope to have a Scottish commissioner at one point? Well, that was considered at the time, and you'll be aware that um, uh, in the last year it was estimated there were around uh, 55 potential cases of trafficking and exploitation identified in uh, Scotland. We suspect that's the tip of the iceberg, but the, uh, it's difficult at this stage to quantify exactly how many there will potentially be. And the view was that uh, having a, a commissioner that could be dealing with what may be a relatively small number uh, may actually uh, not be advantageous, whereas working with a commissioner who may be dealing with a much wider number and gaining greater experience and also good practice that's been experienced from uh, uh, other parts of the UK would be a useful way in which to actually uh, take this approach forward. Notwithstanding that, there's a specific aspect in terms of Scottish ministers' engagement with the Commissioner and their role in Scotland in terms of reporting to us, being able to put forward specific work that we wish them to take forward in Scotland as well, and also feeding into uh, uh, Parliament for any reports that they may lay that we think uh, need to be laid in the Scottish Parliament. So, um, uh, although they're operating on a UK-wide basis, uh, they have a very specific aspect, and Scottish ministers have a direct role uh, in directing that and shaping that. Uh, but it was to make sure that we had someone who could draw upon that wider experience uh, that can help to feed into our processes to improve uh, the work that we are taking forward around tackling human trafficking and exploitation. Thank you. Elaine, followed by Roderick. Um, there has been some criticism of the proposed remit of the Anti-Slavery Commissioner and that it might be too limited. I just wondered, in terms of the bill which the Scottish Government is going to be bringing forward on human exploitation and trafficking, whether some of those issues around the protection and assistance of survivors is going to be um, picked up in the Scottish Bill? 
So one of the aspects we have within the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill is the uh, uh, the requirement on Scottish ministers to ensure that the needs of victims and survivors get the right type of support and assistance which they require, which goes beyond what's within the uh, uh, the uh, the UK uh, bill. So our approach will take um, a, a slightly uh, a, a more ambitious approach to making sure that that happens much more effectively. And as I said on Friday, um, uh, our view is that uh, given the heinous nature of these particular crimes uh, and the way in which they are hidden, uh, which in itself can also have an impact on uh, uh, victims being reluctant to engage with services and there have been cases in the past where individuals have been identified and then they've gone missing, um, is to make sure that we are providing the right support and assistance to those individuals who are victims and that's why we have placed a requirement in our bill for Scottish Minister to do that. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that through the requirement that's placed in the bill to create a, a national strategy here in Scotland and a key part of that will be about making sure that we have the right support and assistance for victims. There won't be any sort of conflict between the UK-wide Commissioner and what we want to do up here. We can make that seamless. Well, I think we should learn from one another and obviously the UK government are taking a particular approach but we uh, are very much of the view that we need to make sure that, uh, that uh, victims of these types of crimes need the right type of support and assistance and that's why we have chosen to take an approach in our own bill uh, which is about making sure that they are at the very heart of the process that we take forward and the requirement, it's not just a national strategy which we, we we can choose to do or not, it's a requirement within the actual bill, uh, will ensure that we have that type of provision embedded in the practice that we take forward in Scotland. Thank you. And it's, I don't want to preempt the Bureau, but I think it's most likely that, that bill will come to this committee, the Human Trafficking Bill, but that's a matter for the Bureau. Roderick. Um, thank you, Convener. Could I um, just like to um, refer to the, um, the Home Office's review of the National <coughs> Referral Mechanism? for victims of human trafficking, obviously, which has been fairly recently published. And in the, the Modern Slavery Bill, obviously 41B provides that the Commission must encourage good practice in terms of the identification of victim of those offences. The UK government has accepted all of the recommendations in this document, but I, I take it from your letter on the Human Trafficking Bill that the full implications of that for Scotland are not yet known. Um, I'm just really seeking some reassurance in terms of this LCM um, that, that down the path, as it were, there won't be an issue. Well, um, obviously we've brought forward the LCM based upon the timetable that's been set by the UK government around the modern slavery uh, uh, bill and the reporting time frame that they've uh, set. And uh, our, our view at the present time is that the provisions within that bill that apply to Scotland are ones which we are supportive of um, uh, 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 as well. I'm, um, I can bring officials in to maybe comment a bit further in terms of the particular report itself, but um, um, uh, what we are also keen to do is to, uh, legislation is one aspect of this, um, uh, there is also the wider work that we need to take forward in tackling human trafficking, that's why um, uh, we have placed this requirement in ministers to bring forward a national strategy um, and to clearly evaluate and to maintain and uh, review that. Um, I'm, uh, what do you call, um, I'm of the view that with their own bill, we will be in an even stronger position than the provisions that are uh, also provided in the, the modern slavery uh, bill uh, at UK. But in terms of the LCM, that has been largely dictated to by the uh, reporting and time frame that's been set by uh, Westminster uh, and bringing it before uh, uh, before Parliament. Neil, do you want to say a bit more about the report itself? The other? Yeah, just confirm that uh, we're due to speak to uh, Home, of Home Office officials uh, actually this afternoon uh, about the NRM review and what the implications of that would be and the timescales of what they're planning to, to do. What um, the, the Home Secretary has said is that she's keen to, to take forward a number of, uh, of pilots to try and test out uh, how the, the approach proposed by the, the NRM review, uh, how that might operate in practice. And early indications are, obviously, that if they're going to be piloting, the timescales for that will certainly extend beyond, beyond the timescale of the, the modern slavery uh, bill. So in terms of your question, we're not expecting anything arising from the NRM to impact on the, that bill and therefore on the, the LCM. But clearly we are going to work very closely with them about what the, the implications of the, the NRM, because as you say, the, the issue of identifying victims is absolutely crucial to this, uh, the, this whole area. Thank you.
Uh, the LCM notes that um, Scottish police officers will, in some circumstances, require the consent of the Secretary of State. Can you give us some idea of uh, what that kind of circumstance would be for them to proceed, and do you think that's appropriate? I think uh, this is in relation to um, uh, some issues around international law, uh, which are reserved um, to Westminster, so and some international uh, 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 protocols around uh, aspects and the legal definition or the legal explanation of that can uh, it can best be provided by officials, but it's because there are some aspects which are reserved that the um, uh, that would require the Secretary of State um, uh, uh, to be able to give permission. My understanding is that these are likely to be exercised through delegated powers to the UK Border Agency uh, in taking forward these matters. But it's um, it's largely around, around around, as I say, some areas which remain reserved to Westminster. These really relate to the boarding of foreign vessels, um, and, and all of that is regulated by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, and that requires uh, any circumstance where a foreign vessel is to be boarded to be routed through a central authority in the, the country whose officers uh, 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 propose to board that vessel. Um, the central authority for the UK is the Secretary of State because, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, this is a, a reserved matter. UK territorial waters? No, that's would be outside. Well, that's when you get out of them. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, OK. I understand can I, that. Uh, sorry, can I maybe also just say, you know, that, that that provision applies equally to police officers from England and Wales yeah. and from Northern Ireland. It's not a pe peculiarly Scottish well, aspect. Clarification. So. so when you get out with UK territorial <coughs> waters, there has to be a special with international conventions about boarding ships beyond. Yeah. That's fine. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes this evidence session. I'm going to suspend for five minutes to, before we move on to the next item of business. Though I have to say before that that we will have to draft a report by our next meeting, the 6th of January. Thank you.
very much. Um, I now move on to item four, support legislation, draft public services reform, inspection and monitoring of prisons, Scotland order. Um, and I have, we heard evidence 2nd December from a number of interested parties today. We're taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary and his officials before the Cabinet Secretary moves a motion recommending approval of the instrument. The Cabinet Secretary is still with us. Now, welcome uh, to the meeting of Scottish Government officials. Andy Bruce, who was here before, Deputy Director of Community Justice System. Kerry Morgan, Community Justice Division, and Craig McGuffey, Director of Legal Services. And again, a very brief opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. And can I remind members, this is an evidence session, so you can ask questions, but thereafter, and the next item will be a debate, so officials can't take part in the debate. I've got John Pentland, John Finney, Roderick and Christian. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, uh, I... Uh, I understand that this has been a, a long journey to uh, get to where we are today and the draft order under consideration has uh, benefited greatly from public consultation and the views previously expressed by this committee. I believe the model before you provides a system of independent monitoring which relies on volunteers as representatives of civic society and is professional, accountable and importantly uh, compliant with the optimal protocol to the uh, Convention Against Torture and other cruel, humane, inhumane or uh, degrading treatment or punishment, OPCAT. Uh, the new system will introduce consistency of practice, effective leadership and governance and allow for the better integration of inspection and monitoring. It will promote and raise the profile of independent monitoring and ensure that all parts of every prison are monitored on a regular basis. Our priority is to ensure that this reform uh, of independent monitoring delivers the best outcomes for prisoners, safeguards uh, their human rights and meets our obligation under OPCAT and the National Preventative Mechanism. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Right, starting with John Pentland, then John Finney. Take a note, all of you, Roderick, Christian, then Elaine. John. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, witnesses have raised some concerns about the independence of the IPMs. And would you like to confirm whether you are satisfied uh, that the revised draft order is fully compliant with the requirements of OPCAT? Obviously, in deciding on the uh, final model, the should be taken forward uh, the independence of the uh, uh, the independent prison monitors and the way in which that will operate has been important. That's why uh, it's been placed with um, uh, uh, Her Majesty Inspector of uh, Prisons for Scotland uh, who are independent of government, they are independent of the SPS, they are established under royal warrant uh, and uh, uh, having them placed within that particular location ensures that they are independent uh, in their process and how they take this uh, work forward on that basis, uh, we uh, uh, are uh, of the view that it is compliant with OPCAT. Okay, and with regards to the concerns that were raised by the, uh, the witnesses with regards to the independence of the IPMs, do you have any comment on that? Well, we're confident they're independent in terms of the role which they have, um, uh, that they uh, will operate under um, uh, the uh, the prisons inspectorate, uh, which is independent of government, uh, the role will be, uh, for example, there are three aspects of the role. So there's the, uh, the inspections that they can undertake, the monitoring visits that they can undertake around um, uh, agreed programme with governors. Um, there is also the uh, agreed programme which they can have with the uh, prison monitoring coordinators, uh, who have an important role making sure that we are looking at all of our establishments and in all aspects of our establishments. And there is also the third aspect, where there is the discretion of independent prison monitors to decide to uh, undertake a monitoring visit themselves. So um, I, I believe that gives them uh, uh, flexibility and independence uh, in order to undertake the uh, role which, they, uh, which will be an important part of the overall way in which we run our prison system in Scotland. I can be near, uh would you, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to comment on the constitution, uh, uh, the constitution of the advisory group and clarify uh, the process for appointments to it? Well, an important part of the advisory group is to make sure that they've obviously got um, a, a level of oversight um, of the way in which the uh, monitoring system has operated. Um, uh, my understanding is that um, uh, our managing inspector of uh, 
uh, at prisons um, is of a view that it should be uh, someone who's independent that chairs uh, that particular uh, uh, advisory group uh, and also uh, that they should have a range of different stakeholders on it uh, in order to uh, help to support and inform uh, that work. Um, I think there's been some indication around the range of individuals or uh, organisations that could be represented on it. So, for example, um, uh, the Scottish Human Rights uh, Commission uh, are a body that I understand that the uh, inspectors of the view that would be uh, uh, that he would wish to see as part of the uh, uh, as part of the independent advisory group. Thank you, John. John Finney, followed by Roderick. This issue has been around for quite some time and it's had quite a thrashing about and come back in various forms. I think you would agree that perception is a terribly important issue here. And while some of us know the individuals involved, for instance, I know Mr Strang, I know him to be an individual of the highest integrity, the perception of rotad visit visits as compared to spontaneous visits, can you understand that some people might have a perception that there's an element of control there that takes away what people would understand to be the purpose of visits to be, or one of the purposes of visits, to be a spot check, for want of a better phrase? Well, as I mentioned earlier on, there are three different uh, natures and ways in which those monitoring visits can take place. Um, uh, what I would say is that uh, a, a rotated visit is, a, a, is not in any way different from any other independent visit that's taking place. It may be you have less autonomy in that it's been rotated as part of the work programme, and I think uh, it's important to make sure that we uh, have all of our establishments uh, being properly monitored and clearly the, uh, uh, the coordinators have an important role to play in helping to shape that work programme to ensure that that's happening and that all aspects of the prison are also being considered. But there is also the option for independent prison monitors to be able to actually uh, undertake their own uh, uh, monitoring visits um, uh, without notification. So they, they are in a position where they can do that in addition to it. So I think we've now got a much more comprehensive way of looking at this issue, which I believe is much more helpful. Um, I do understand that some people may feel as though that um, uh, they may argue that that limits their independence. My view, it may limit their autonomy in some way, but it doesn't undermine the independence of the monitoring process and it allows us to make sure that we've got a much more comprehensive view of the monitoring process as well, uh, which allows us to make sure that all of our establishments and all aspects of the establishments are being effectively monitored, which has not always been the case in the past, uh, uh, which I think is why it's important that we do have a system which is comprehensive and that it uh, is able to do that effectively and independently. Well, that, that's very reassuring. To push you on the one point, though, the perception of rotas and programmes suggests a measure of control there that some might believe would inhibit. Just so for the avoidance of any doubt, an authorised person can go to any prison at any time if they've concerned about an issue that's out with the programme. If the, if, the, if the independent prison monitor wishes to undertake an additional visit, uh, which is out with the rota programme, then they're able to undertake that visit. Um, uh, it can be part of the rota, which has been obviously been agreed with governors. It can be part of the program of work that's been agreed with the uh, uh, prison monitoring uh, coordinators, um, uh, and it can be uh, something which they choose to do uh, on their own uh, for whatever reason they feel it would be appropriate for them to do so. Well, that's very reassuring. We heard last week, and we've heard throughout the, the, the process, evidence from the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And I think it would be fair, certainly my summary of it is, that it was a less than compelling endorsement. They're not again it, but they're hardly giving it a ringing endorsement. W would you welcome their continued involvement in the process here? And I, I presume there'll be some evaluation of how the, the, the new system, if it's agreed, will, will operate. Oh, very much so. I think the SHRC have got an important part to play in helping to take forward this new programme of uh, prison monitoring. And that's why um, I understand that um, uh, 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 Mr Strang is uh, keen for them to be a member of the advisory board and also to have an independent chair of that advisory board as well uh, uh, in order to take that work forward. And I think uh, you've also touched upon an important aspect of it is that is for us a, an appropriate point is to evaluate how things are moving forward with the uh, with the um, uh, with the uh, new monitoring system. And I've got no doubt that should the advisory 
uh, uh, group uh, feel that there are issues that need to be improved or that aren't working effectively, then they'll be able to flag those up, uh, address them effectively. If there are issues for government uh, to take forward, then I I'd be more than happy to explore that with them uh, once they feel that they're at a point where they've had a full assessment of the work that they've been undertaking. Thank you. That's very welcome. Thank you. Roderick, followed by Christian, please. Secretary, just uh, following on from my colleague's comments on the Scottish Human Rights Commission, um, one of the concerns expressed by Mr Adamson in evidence was a concern that resources might be taken away from unannounced visits uh, in order uh, to support the rota and visits and the, and the second type of uh, visit. What reassurance can you provide that that won't be the case? There's a, there's a danger in me prescribing what happens here is that we compromise our independence. So what I'm keen to do is, uh, what I'm, I'm keen and I'm sure will happen is that uh, there will be a balance uh, which will be struck around um, uh, the, uh, the ad hoc uh, monitoring visits that take place, the, uh, uh, the work programme which uh, uh, is agreed with the uh, uh, prison monitoring coordinators and obviously the uh, uh, programme which is also agreed with individual establishments at prisons. What I'm keen to do is to make sure that all of our establishments are, uh, on an annual basis, are being effectively monitored on all aspects of them where possible, are being effectively uh, monitored, and that the reports that come from that are ones that can help to inform us about any changes or improvements that need to be made, or where good practice has been experienced, how that can be shared across the rest of the establishment. So I don't want to get into a situation where um, uh, that I am in danger of prescribing how much there should be for one thing or the other. I've got no doubt that um, it will be... Uh, it will be in uh, uh, the interests of the uh, 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 the chief inspector uh, and the way in which the advisory board operate is to make sure that they achieve a balance between those uh, which are unannounced, uh, uh, which are uh, also uh, taken forward as part of the programmed work and also uh, part of the agreed programme that they have with the uh, prison governors. I think I'm also correct in saying is that even the work which is agreed with the, uh, uh, the prison uh, monitor coordinators uh, is also part of what could be unannounced work as well. So there's part of it's agreed with governors uh, but the other aspects that the uh, prison monitor coordinators have got about trying to make sure that all other prisons are covered and also that uh, as many aspects of it are con considered as well as part of it, it can be unannounced um, uh, as part of that work programme. Thank you. Um, Pete White from Positive Prison um, in Evidence said to us that he thinks the conduct of the independent monitors will determine how they are viewed by prisoners. They will have to develop a way of working that builds trust, but it sometimes takes a personality rather than an order to make that happen. Would you agree with that comment? I think when it comes to <coughs> developing a, a, a relationship, and if you consider where a, a prisoner may be in terms of being in prison in, term, uh, in relation to the level of trust they may have in disclosing individual information to an individual, uh, it's extremely important that the independent monitors are able to uh, 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 to provide that reassurance and to be seen as trustworthy and able to uh, provide them with the support and the guidance that uh, an individual prisoner may require. So personal relationships are key, are an important part of it. Uh, uh, and uh, part of that will be to make sure that our independent prison monitors are effectively trained and that they have the necessary skills and attributes which are required to be able to do that. So. You know, I know at times that trust in a prison can probably be at a premium. Uh, that's why it's extremely important that uh, the individuals who undertake this work and engaging with prisoners are able to uh, offer the necessary assurance and uh, support that's required for a prisoner to be able to disclose information to them if he feels appropriate. Thank you. Question followed by Elaine, followed by Margaret. Thank you. Uh, just about the next steps and about what we are doing today, I know that uh, John Finney said that we've uh, been talking about this for a long time and we had uh, Professor Coyle who was not sure if we should move on yet when uh, Dr. James McManus said, let's get this going. Uh, we know that the one implication will be that if we pass this order today is that we'll be upcut uh, uh, compliant. But what of implication for prison visiting in Scotland if the order is not passed today? Well, if the order is not passed today, it's the status quo. And um, if the order is not passed, we're then uh, in a situation where uh, we uh, would not be changing the system as has been proposed in the model that's outlined in this particular order. So uh, we would effectively have the status quo as a result. 
So apart from the fact that we won't be OPCAT uh, com com compliant. Do Exist you mean? Not OPCAT compliant, yeah. no. It's not. Uh, but the new model is OPCAT compliant. Okay, thank you. That's it. Excellent. No, no you've, got, you've got another question. No, that's right. No, that was it. No, I didn't mean that's it for all of you, just for Christian. Don't panic, Margaret. Elaine, followed by Margaret. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, a recent addition to the uh, proposals was the monitoring duties uh, of a requirement to oversee temporary release of prisoners. Can you explain a little bit more what that means? Kerry's probably the best place to maybe give you a bit more detail around that. So some of that is um, uh, reflective of the feedback we've had from the consultation process, of which there have been several uh, consultation processes over the year. But um, uh, some aspects of that have come about as a result of some of the feedback we received in the course of the consultation. Yeah, that, uh, that addition was made to the order in light of legal advice that, that Craig could uh, describe better to you, but we didn't want to be in a position where a prisoner wanted to speak to an independent monitor about aspects of their time to release, and because we hadn't stipulated that in, in the order, that they wouldn't be able to do so. So, for example, if they wanted to discuss things around the transport to, to their time to release um, location, or their temporary release being cut short, we didn't want to, to have a situation legally where an independent monitor wasn't able to, uh, to speak to the prisoner about that merely because we hadn't included those, those words. But Craig, Craig could uh, describe better the legal position on that. So the, the, the issue arose during the, the drafting process. Uh, the, the powers that we previously gave to the chief inspector to inspect prisons and the treatment of prisoners, and also the powers that we gave to <coughs> excuse me, uh, prison monitors to inspect to monitor prisons and uh, monitor the treatment of prisoners, referred to the, the, the treatment of prisoners within prisons. And it was those words, within prisons, that we were concerned may have created a loophole whereby I, uh, the chief inspector would be prevented from inspecting the, the, the arrangement for temporary release, and, and similarly, prison monitors would be prevented from monitoring the arrangement for, 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 for temporary release. Um, we considered taking out the words within prisons. Um, following discussions with Parliamentary Council, it was decided that that wouldn't be enough um, to, to close that particular loophole. Um, so that's why the, the additional paragraph was added. It's not intended to, to create a, a, a significant extra burden on, on prison monitors. It's just simply there to, to close a potential loophole that may have prevented temporary release arrangements being considered. Thanks. Will that be made clear with guidance and so on? Because it, it, you know, it is open to interpretation that it's putting a fairly onerous responsibility on, on monitors. No guidance will go alongside the work. Um, the operational aspects, obviously, for uh, how the order will operate in itself. There's also concerns around um, the requirement, what looks like a requirement for the prison monitors to use the official complaints system of the SPS, where some prisoners don't have a lot of confidence in the official system. Can you clarify what? Yes. <laughs> I'm just checking that you're asking about complaints. The complaint system, whether or not. Voices on either side of me, some in my head as well. So there you are. Thank you, Elaine. As long as it's not complaints from either side of you. So, uh, Sometimes it is cabinet sector, but I ignore those. So. Um, uh, there are obviously two aspects to this. One is that there's obviously the, the formal complaints process, which has been reviewed and changed, and the, there's the additional aspect that it goes to the Public Services Ombudsman uh, uh, within the prison service as well. So there have been improvements made to the, the SPS complaints process. There is, of course, also the opportunity for, um, if an issue is raised with an independent prison monitor, uh, that they feel that they uh, wish to pursue directly themselves, that they're able to do so as well. They are still, they're still in a position to be able to do that. Um, but uh, uh, out with that, there is the formal uh, uh, prison complaints process, which has been enhanced and extends now into the public service ombudsman, which it didn't previously. Um, uh, so that has been improved alongside uh, uh, these changes. And it will be open to a prisoner in discussion with the monitor to decide that they don't want to take the official route and that they would rather take a more informal route? And that, that's at their discretion where they feel that that may not be the most appropriate way to do it. It depends on the nature of it uh, and that particular uh, prison monitor on how they feel it could be most effectively taken forward. Yeah, Professor Coyle felt that the draft order is actually weaker than the existing re legislation in, re in regard to the, cap the capability of, of prisoners to take things up directly. Well, there's, you know, there is a complaints process. That formal process has always been there, uh, and the order doesn't change that. 
Um, but the order through the uh, 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 independent prison monitors and the way in which they'll be established will be able to pursue a complaint directly themselves if they feel that's the most appropriate way in which to achieve it. It would be like for yourself, we, you know, there are, uh, we've all experienced constituents who have raised particular issues and sometimes the best way is just to directly engage with the organisation. Sometimes it is to go through the formal complaints process. It depends on the nature of the complaint, but there's flexibility there to do that if the independent, uh, the independent prison monitor chooses to do so. Thank you. Thanks very much, Margaret. Um, just picking up a little bit and then on the complaint system, um, I understand that the, the draft order was consulted on September and then redrafted in November. In September, the, um, the role of monitors in handling complaints was removed. And I think that was without warning, it's fair to say, and then reinstated partially in November. And we're now at a situation, if I understand it properly, where... Um, concern has been expressed from the SHRC and Howard League that the proposal for independent prison monitors to assist with the existing internal complaints weakens the process. Is that the case? Are they being asked to? Uh, so the process, as I outlined before, yeah. there is that they can assist a, an individual prisoner in pursuing a complaint through the complaints process itself. The internal SPS yeah. uh, complaints process, I think that's the, the which can then take you to the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman, uh, so which would be external, which would take it to the point where it would remove, it would then go out with the SPS itself. Okay, that's a normal complaints process. There is the opportunity for an indiv independent prison monitor to be able to actually take up an issue themselves uh, within an establishment or within the SPS about an issue that's been raised with them by a prisoner. But in terms of the changes that we made, um, uh, can maybe be able to offer you a wee bit more of the background as to how that came about? Yeah. I think the crucial point is they would be helping with the internal complaint system, and that was seen from the evidence last week to be compromising their independence in the eyes, potentially, of the prisoners. Um, and there was a real human rights issue here as a result. Already an answer to that in the middle of the earlier kerfuffle, but perhaps you'll clarify about, you know... Uh, uh, I, is it the, the, that, that's an issue of choice. Uh, so that if, if the prison monitor wants to assist them, take them through the complaints process, which takes you to the point which is uh, going to the Public Service Ombudsman who's out with the SPS and is independent in these matters, I, I'm not entirely sure how that compromises their independence so uh, I'm not entirely clear how they've arrived at that particular viewpoint but there is also the the, the possibility for a, a, an independent prison monitor to pursue an issue through uh, uh, through the establishment the SPS directly themselves so I'm not entirely sure how they've arrived at that particular viewpoint and it's not necessarily one from what you've explained that I would share. You keep mentioning the, to the SPS, but can, can something be raised, prisoner raise something with independent prison monitor and take it to the governor without going through the, pro I think that's yes. part yes, of the of thing you're trying to ask. Yes, of this, course they can. can. So they can, they can go directly to the governor about a particular issue that's been raised with them. They don't have to go through the formal complaints process. So just to, just to take that point further. The independent prison monitor can go directly to the governor with, with any issue that they see fit that a prisoner or any, uh, any person in the prison has raised with them. They can also go to the chief inspector who can then raise that with Scottish ministers or can come to, can come to the parliament. So, and when we're talking about the independent prison monitor's role in the formal complaints process, what we're talking about is assisting prisoners who may have literacy issues, who may not understand the system. It's about assisting a prisoner where they have decided they want to go through the formal process to do that. It's not about the independent prison monitor being seen as part of the system that is dealing with the complaint. I understand that, but perception, as you will understand, Cabinet Secretary, is, is everything. Uh, and it was a, a point raised specifically, if they helped, if they chose to help, if a prisoner chose to involve them in that, it may be seen to be compromising their position. Um, I wonder if I could ask specifically about um, the number of independent prisoner monitors that are envisaged and is there any kind of idea for the number of, of visits? Is that provided anywhere? So there is an issue around the visits, which is that establishment should be uh, visited on an annual basis, that there should be a range of those visits that take place across the, 
uh, course of the year. The issue is about the uh, visits taking place rather than the actual number of independent prison monitors. So um, it would be once it's established for them to determine how many require. There's going to be the three coordinators um, who will be responsible. Uh, they will require a sufficient number of independent prison monitors in order to undertake the uh, 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 that they are going to they are going to carry out. So, for example, establishments I believe are due to be the under the order will require to be monitored on a weekly basis. Um, so, uh, they're not, therefore going to have to have a number enough independent uh, monitors in order to allow that to happen. So, it's the frequency which is the important aspect rather than the actual global number uh, that are actually uh, uh, brought on board to act as independent prison monitors. So. Um, uh, so it will then be determined based upon the need to carry out these frequent visits and monitoring visits uh, to then have a cohort of staff that are uh, able to actually undertake that workload. I think the difficulty here is both capacity in terms of the three types of visits that you've mentioned, and there's the rota, then there's the, um, the visits that have to be approved or coordinated with the prison governor. And then lastly, we've got without prior notice. And I think there's a real concern that without the prior notice may slip if there's more predominance or influence or priority given to the other two. And just the sheer capacity of carrying out three different types. I mean, do we have any idea how many independent monitors we might need or how many visits we're talking about? But well, I'm not specifying how many there should be, so I don't know how we can question their capacity. If I was saying that we should have five, you may say to me that there are issues about capacity, about them being able to undertake that range of work, but we're not specifying the number. We're specifying the frequency to which those visits should take place. So there's a weekly monitoring visit that needs to take place. There is a programme of work around making sure that all the establishments are are covered on a regular uh, on that weekly basis, but also all aspects of the establishment are considered... So it will then be for the uh, Chief Inspector of Prisons along with the uh, advisory group to determine what's the right number to actually have in order to get the right complement of monitoring visits taking place uh, on the frequency to which the order has set out. We'll so I don't, I don't understand how we could question capacity if we haven't specified the number. Will this all be left to guidance? Pardon? Will this be left to guidance, number well, of visits, the, um, the number of independent monitors uh, appointed? The, the visits are set out in the order. The frequency of visits is set out in the order. And the number of independent monitors, will that be set out in guidance? That, that will be taken forward by the, uh, the, independent, the inspector of prisons in Scotland to determine how many are required with the advisory group how many they require in order to meet the requirements set under the order. And that is, there has to be the weekly monitoring visit undertaken. So is this something that's covered by guidance so along with the monitoring of the temporary release that um, independent monitors are being asked to, to set out? Specifying the number. We are, we are not determining how many you should have. We've been questioned about the independence of them. We are not saying this is how many you should have because then people would say, well, you're limiting the number of them in order to make sure they only do X, Y, or Z. We are saying you have to do at least one monitoring visit per week in every establishment in Scotland. It's for you to determine how many independent monitors you require in order to do that and to meet the capacity that's necessary in order to achieve that. So we are not constraining it. We are giving them the opportunity to determine how many they require to do the job. I think my difficulty is just the scrutiny of this. So um, could I ask, um, for example, would the Cabinet Secretary be agreeable to any additional uh, guidance having statutory scrutiny and, uh, or being subject to a statutory review? We're now getting into the territory of me limiting uh, the role, which was part of the purpose behind having it undertaken by the... Uh, uh, the Chief Inspector of Prisons to determine this process so and how that works on an operational basis. If I start issuing statutory guidance on this is how many you require, I will then be subject to the accusation of is it you're compromising its independence because you're defining it and you're constraining it. So what we're doing is we're creating the ground rules, what's expected, the visits that are required. 
We've put in place the advisory uh, group that will be responsible for monitoring and evaluating how it's operating, which, as the Chief Inspector has indicated, his preferred view would be for that to be an independent person. It will have stakeholders such as the Scottish Human Rights Commission on it in order to determine it. If they believe that, for example, the number of independent monitors that have been appointed is insufficient in order to undertake the work effectively, then I would expect the Chief Inspector of Prisons to respond to that type of issue. So if I start getting into determining this is how many there should be, this is the constraints in which you should operate, I will then start to compromise independence, which has been such an important part of the new model that's been taken forward. I think there's a balance to be struck between um, interfering and having the appropriate checks and balances, and that's what um, I fear there may not be uh, at present as the order is laid. That's more of a debating point, which we come to later is. than the question. As nobody has asked it, I'll ask because one of the issues was the personnel who make up very important independent uh, prison monitoring committees who are generally of a certain ethnicity, a certain age. They're usually quite often retired because they've got time off. And it seems that when the relationship between the people coming in as monitors with individual prisoners is so important, it would be good if they could relate uh, to the parties who are coming in. Now, one of the issues was about not getting time off work with pay to do it, which is there any way that this can be addressed? It's not in the legislation, but can it be addressed? It does seem very, very difficult for some prisoners to relate to certain people coming in. Not the same wrong with the people, just different backgrounds, different age. Very difficult to tell intimate details to them. So is there any thought being given to this, to extending the pool, as it were, of people through giving them paid leave? from work, as they do in other, as I understand they do it, if they're in the GTC or Scottish Environment Protection Agency, it gives them time off, local authorities, you know, is there any way of addressing that imbalance? Well, the intention is to try and recruit as widely as possible for individuals who'd be attracted to uh, take on the role of independent prison uh, monitors, so to try and uh, encourage as wide a range of individuals as uh, possible. There are some technical issues around uh, payment aspects uh, and uh, legislation in this particular area um, and uh, Craig can probably offer you a bit of legal advice around some of the complexities around this particular issue but what I can assure you of is that uh, uh, the, 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 the intention is that the independent prison monitors should be as reflective of our society as possible uh, and when that's advertised um, uh, no doubt committee members will have maybe know of individuals uh, who they think would be very suitable to that type of role and I'd be keen for you to encourage them to, under, to, to consider applying for a post. Uh, uh, I think you would agree that given the additional duties that it's extremely difficult for somebody in employment who's not going to get time off or paid or whatever to take it up and we're likely to have the same decent people coming in but from the same catchment. So is there any way that this can be... Mr. McGuffey, I'm looking at you with anticipation. The, the difficulty with this one is that um, it's we consider that this would be out with the legislative competence of the Parliament. Um, paragraph two of, of um, Schedule Two to the, the Scotland Act um, provides that the Scottish Parliament can't modify or confer power by subordinate legislation to modify the law and reserve matters, and the subject matter of the Employment Rights, Rights Act is reserved. Um, we can make consequential so the subject, subject matter of the Employment Rights Act 1996 is reserved. Um, we can make consequential changes to that. that are consequential. Uh, is parts. there any way in, in liaison with the UK government that this could be done? I think it happens elsewhere in the UK. And it would seem to me that it, this is a fairly reasonably reasonable thing to do if you want to make a system work. Potentially. I think the last change, uh, I need to check that bit, I think the last change to Section 50 of the Employment Rights Act to, to add a, a, a Scottish-based body uh, was um, along the lines of water, uh, the Water Scotland Act, but I think that, that required an LCM to make that change. So it is possible that an LCM could be agreed. Potentially. Just to put another thing in your entry, Cabinet Secretary, I know you have not enough to do. No, of course not. <laughs> so, uh, and it's much appreciated. But we'll certainly... Uh, we'll call <laughs> We'll certainly, um, um, uh, we'll certainly um, uh, give further consideration to that, convener. I think 
think so. so. I think the committee generally felt that was a fair point being made, um, and it's the people who make the th system of work course. in prison monitoring. Basically, the process may be very fine, but it's the quality and the, the range of people in that will make it successful. Right, uh, that ends the evidence session. I now move on to item five which is the debate itself, the formal debate. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S4M11850. The Justice Committee recommends draft public services reform inspection and monitoring of prison Scotland order 2014 be approved. Moved. Uh, do any members wish to speak in the debate in the motion? Margaret. Yeah. Um, having listened to last week's evidence session and this week's evidence session, it's with regret, Cabinet Secretary, that I have to say I don't think the order does um, provide for a better system as it's laid out at present. There are too many questions and far too much is being left to guidance and guidance um, which is being developed and led by the SPCS Deputy Government who's the project lead and we don't question her, I don't question her integrity for a moment but inevitably she is going to look at things specifically through the SPS um, viewpoint. For all of these uh, reasons, then I think we're looking at an inferior system. We're using a, a hammer to crack a, a, a nut um, in bending over backwards to be OPCAT compliant. I think in other jurisdictions, the function is taken over by the Ombudsman. End of story. That would have rectified what was a good system, not a perfect system before, but a good system with a little <laughs> tweaking could have been improved. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, obviously, just reflect on the fact that this uh, matter has had a long history to get to where we are today. I think it's important to reflect on the fact that kind of distinctions between inspection and monitoring have uh, come out very well in the evidence, and I'm very impressed by uh, uh, David Strang's evidence on that point uh, about them being complementary but not distinct. Obviously, there are concerns which have been expressed by the Scottish Human Rights Commission. I'm reassured by what the Cabinet Secretary's had to say in respect to that today, but I would hope that uh, going forward we would recognise and continue to recognise as OPCAT requires the continuing importance of the unannounced visit. Um, obviously, in terms of complaints procedure, we've dealt with that today, I think, quite comprehensively, and I'd reiterate what Dr McManus said in evidence that the, the important thing is to bolster, um, not subvert the existing complaints pr process. Uh, again, as far as the advisory group is concerned, I think I'm reassured by what the Cabinet Secretary said this morning. I think the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, and uh, I hope and wish it well. Billy? Yes, I'm, I'm a bit, I suppose in a sense, in a bit of a quandary about, about this. Uh, I accept that there's been a lot of uh, progress made since the original order, and there's obviously been attempts to address many of the issues. The problem for me, I think, is that I'm not yet convinced it's the best model, and I know, nor was Professor Coyle convinced that this was actually the best model. You know, there can be an argument for a system more like that in England and Wales might be a preferable model. I think that was his preferred model. I need you to convince me that there is a reason not to, to start again and look, re-look at the model, uh, and that actually that going forward, yeah, that, that we're not settling for something inferior and going forward with this, rather than actually ripping it up and starting again with, with maybe a different model altogether. John. Finney. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I mean, I ha had reservations, and I, 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 they were been apparent last week in the line of questioning that, that I took. Um, this has been on the go for a long time. I think the crucial question that was posed was posed by my colleague Christian Allard when he talked about whether the present system is OPCAT compliant or not, and the uh, present system isn't. This is. Is anything perfect? Will we strive for perfection? I've been reassured with what I've heard today with regard to the ongoing monitoring of it and the, the, the role for people who have been critical, namely the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and for that reason I, I, th I think we should go and always look to be improving, but go with the present, uh, what's being proposed here. Well, I, um, I've started out from the position that what was in place previously was very imperfect. There were very good prison visiting committees and some pretty poor ones. We know that from the evidence we had earlier on before the redrafted legislation. So that's where I start from. I'm 
I've been content at the explanation about the road, had concerns about a rota system, but when that was put as a kind of context, a back cloth, is very distinct from an inspection, that by regularly visiting a place, you can get a sense of changes that are taking place, and this does not impede ad hoc uh, inspections being taken place by the IPM. So I'm, I'm content about that. Um, I'm also uh, more content now that I've heard further evidence about the complaints process, because I had concerns that if you're asking prisoners to go through the formal process and a place they're complaining about, it's the last thing they maybe want to do. Maybe appropriate if there's um, difficulties in uh, writing and so on, and there's uh, difficulties just simply in putting down the prisoner's words. But I'm pleased when I heard that, in fact, you can still make complaints through the um, IPM directly to the governor, bypass, as it were, the formal process, if that's appropriate. So that's a lot better. HMRC now being on the role of the advisor group, yes, uh, that's made a big difference. Um, you know, it's not perfect. I've yet to sit here and hear a piece of legislation come in front of me that's perfect. Some of it's been terrible over the years. I'm not going to name names. It's happened throughout various executives and uh, the government. But this is a darn sight better. And I think um, I'm in the position of a suck it and see. Uh, I think, from my point of view, there's enough markers being put down in the evidence by this committee um, that, you know, if it does turn out to be flawed, we'll be the first... I'll be the first, I can't speak very well, I'll be the first to jump on it. So given all that and some caveats about how it actually operates, with all these other matters now put into some kind of position for me, I am content, that's my position now, uh, to give my support to this. But I'm happy to hear Cabinet Secretary's further words with regard to concerns of my colleagues. Well, thank you, Convener, and I appreciate all the comments that have been made by all members and the fact that there is um, um, uh, uh, that some members continue to have uh, some anxieties and uh, uh, concerns. Um, I, I think it's important to recognise that um, over many years our prison visiting committees undertook a lot of very good work um, and very important work, and it's a it's an extremely valuable role. And um, uh, despite our intentions and our plans or proposal to change that. I don't want to underestimate the important role that our visiting committees have undertaken and all of those volunteers who have participated in that over uh, the uh, years. But I do believe that the uh, new model which is proposed is one which will allow us to much make sure that we have a much more effective monitoring regime within our prisons which is independent um, of government or the prison system in itself, which will give us a, an additional level of um, uh, understanding as to what's going on within our prison estate, uh, over and above that of our independent inspection regime um, of our prisons, which are a very robust mechanism uh, which take place uh, on a very regular basis. And for those who heard GMS this morning, you would have heard uh, the uh, uh, inspector's most recent uh, findings from uh, HMP uh, shot. So we have a very robust uh, and strong independent inspection regime. And I think the independent monitoring model which we are proposing is a, an effective one which will allow us to have that additional level of confidence around independent monitoring that is taking place. I'm with you in this one, uh, convener, in that um, I... <laughs> I, uh, I, I, but I, I do think it is one of these issues that um, uh, there are other models that could be pursued which have their pros and cons to them. Um, we have sought to try and strike a balance in the approach that we're taking with this uh, particular order, hence the reason the length of time it's taken to arrive at this particular point and the uh, variety of consultations and changes that have been made over that period of time in order to try and address some of these concerns in order to try and accommodate changes within the order in order to uh, uh, try and improve on it. I acknowledge that there are some of those um, who don't feel that we have gone uh, far enough, but uh, this is a system which will be uh, OPCAT compliant. Uh, it's a process which I think um, uh, will help to improve our prison estate and it will help to ensure that we've got robust independent monitoring taking place. And um, I believe uh, we've got the right safeguards in place to monitor its effectiveness as well. And if necessary, uh, to make any further changes that may be required, should uh, those be required at some point in uh, the future. But it's a model that is certainly better than what we have at the present time and one which I think is uh, worthy of the support of the committee. Can I just clarify, you've said something very important, then should you require to make any changes, how would that be done? Sorry, I've come in after you're summing up, but I think that's quite important when we did the 
if, if, if after a period of time there are issues that people feel is a deficiency in the model in terms of how it's operating, then I'm very much of the view that then we should consider that and to see whether there are any changes that may be required to be made to it. Um, I'm confident what we've got is one which will work, but as ever, uh, the test will be in uh, how, it, uh, how it operates, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm certainly at some point in the future, if there are areas where deficiencies have been identified, open to looking at how they can be addressed. Thank you very much. I now move on. The question is that motion S4M11848 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those for the motion, please show. Those against, please show. And there are, I take it, no abstentions. That's seven for, one against. The motion is then agreed to. Thank you very much. Um, we are. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Uh, members are aware we are required to report on all affirmative instruments. Are members content to delegate responsible me to sign off this report? I think it's just a... Sorry? Right. We can bring the report back to the next meeting if you're content. That's, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, we are moving on to private session. Thank you. might have said. Um, item, item 8, one negative instrument, the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Protection Measure Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014, Leak 333. This instrument facilitates the application of Regulation EU number 606-2013 on mutual recognition of protection measures in civil matters. The regulation is part of a package which aims to strengthen victims' rights and is designed to complement the European Protection Order Directive and related regulations which we have just considered. The DPLR committee did not draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument. Do members have any comments in relation to this instrument? So it's Microphone, quite, Roddy, yes. quite important to, to mention that the, the Scottish Government considers the definition could, for example, could cover interdicts and civil non-harassment orders. So um, although the Scottish Government says it doesn't expect uh, much business, I would have thought it perhaps would be more than the, the criminal procedure, which we're not considering. Thank you very much, and thank you for that note. Are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? We now move into private session. Thank you.